Hello, everyone. I'm very excited to welcome you all to our brand new podcast, Today's Top Tech Leaders. The goal of this podcast is to share insights and knowledge of top CTOs and product leaders on their leadership and what they've learned throughout their journey. We'll cover management tips and tricks, organizational structures, tools, and the best practices on how to successfully lead your product team. Our goal is to bring valuable insights to CTOs, CPOs of all seniorities. For today's podcast, it's a pleasure to welcome our first speaker, Florian Gamper. He's an interim CTO and agile evangelist. He has over 20 years of experience working across multiple companies, is a long year member of Code Control, and has worked with companies like BCG Digital Ventures, Oetker Digital, or the incredible successful startup Laser. Florian is an expert in agile methodologies, and he's here today to share his approach and how to build successful teams. Welcome, Florian. Thanks a lot for joining us today. Hi, Mark. Thanks for having me. So um, before we get into your topic, and I think your topic is really uh, agile methodologies, um, I want to ask you one little warm-up question. It's probably the hardest question that I have, but fair enough. Give it a try. If you could go back in time and give your younger self one piece of advice about tech leadership, what would that be? My, my advice would be, and, and I say to this quite often, is like go to the dentist. So... Um, <laughs> Uh, in my first startup, I kind of ruined my teeth because I never had the time to go to the dentist. And it wasn't always like, ah, yeah, it's not it's not that hurtful and, and it's fine. And I'm going to do it next week. And there was always something to do. Um, and in the end, I ended up with very bad teeth. Um, and so it like kind of like corresponds to, every, to health in itself. And if your startup doesn't make it because of that hour where you would be at the dentist, um, it wouldn't have made it at all. And uh, everything else you can buy, but your health is really hard to get back. No. So that means don't overwork. Make sure you stay healthy. <laughs> don't overwork. O overwork start at times. <laughs> start startup <laughs> is startup, but like take care of your health. So do sports, have, have stuff that you like, leisure time, even though it's pressing. Um, try to delegate more than you think you should. Um, so that you get some some space um, and and can take care of yourself. I couldn't agree more. And I think this this doesn't only count for tech, this counts for any leadership. It's uh, probably also what everyone has to learn the hard way <laughs> in the first years of, of running a company. At some point, it comes back to you. Cool. So, Florian, um, I mean, it's, it's very clear when someone reads your LinkedIn profile or, or chats, chats with you, um, you, you really like to advocate for agile methodologies. Now, before we spoke, I personally actually would have thought that um, there needs to be no more advocate for agile. It's, it's clear that any tech team, any startup, any company these days would work with some kind of agile methodologies. Is that wrong or is it just the wrong kind of agile mindset that people have? So I think to like, to answer this question, we have to differentiate two things. is like working agile and having an agile mindset. So a lot of people work in agile frameworks. Let's, let's say they do Scrum, they do Kanban, they do Safe. I, I don't want to say Safe because it's not agile at all. But um, they, they, they work in some frameworks that were built to help doing agile. The problem there is it often it often feels like a cargo cult um, where people just doing stuff because because it's on a list. For example, um, I once talked to a company and said like, "Yeah, we're agile. We do dailies." And I think like, "Okay, that's nice, but like, what are you doing them for?" Yeah, we report too. And I think like, "That's not what a daily is for." Um, and that's the difference between like doing this kind of like you do stuff, but we don't know exactly what each ceremony's purpose is. And that's what I see very often. It's played, but it's not understood. And then, and then it's just a quarter of what it could be, or like 10%. It's still better than that stuff before. That's funny because there, was a, there is a um, scientific uh, paper about that even crappy scrum is better than waterfall. <laughs> but, um, but there is such an enormous potential of when you're doing it right 
um, to see how that impacts your business, uh, your speed. And speed is not the purpose of this, but it just happens because people are happy and they deliver stuff that is that is valuable to them and the customer. And that's the, the real purple of the agile mindset is this not overworking, having a steady flow, um, um, doing something for the customers, but people are more important than processes um, and not faster, cheaper, and I can change everything every day, which is the stuff that is in most minds about it. Okay, interesting, because I think uh, it, it goes along a bit with the fears that people or leaders probably often have, say, well, waterfall, I know what the result is, I can measure the result. Um, yeah. Can you measure results with Agile, or is, sure. is, is there a progress? Sure you can. So think about, like, when, you, when, you, when you're building an application, you can measure the same way um, customer happiness as you can do uh, with with any any other process. You can see if other customer happy with our project. Um, you can measure employee happiness and see how they um, react to some other parts of the mindset, like ownership. So people usually like to have a say in stuff. And if you do that with the teams, you, you, you and there's a difference in ownership, like the difference between being responsible and feeling responsible, something that is like in German often like is seems to be the same, but it's the question if it was handed to you and you're to blame if it fails or if you actually feel responsible for it and want to make it succeed. And the more you get people in that and, and get them understand what they're doing, why they're doing it, what they're doing it for, the more you see they feel ownership and the better feel they feel with what they do. And that's part of the agile mindset is to get this transported and to get people also understand why they're doing stuff. Do I read right in between the lines that um, there is no vanity KPI with X percent of the product has been built, but rather KPI, how much of our goal have we achieved from a user business perspective, I want to make the user happier. I want to make them s solve a certain pain point that, that you need to measure with that this way, rather. So it's a bit, when, when you look at it, like what Agility originally wanted to solve, originally one, Agility wanted to solve the problem that like projects that you run for two years before you release are often off the market very quick because like your audience moved on but you stayed on, on, on the spot that you identified two years ago. So by delivering, the idea by delivering short increments, you're able to steer and you're able to move with your customer base. So when they move a bit to the left, a bit to the right, a bit to the up, a bit to the low, when you, when you look at the quarters, um, you are able to faster adapt to where they're actually heading. And the customers that you identified two years ago doesn't have to be the same that you have when you're finished on a waterfall project, they moved on, they got bigger, they got something else. And in an agile project, you're able to get closer to the customer. Actually, that takes longer than a waterfall project. When you think of like the same features, the same thing, um, exactly knowing what you want, then agility is not what, what you need. And it's, but if you are like a bit uncertain about like your customer, and if you want to like move on with them and meet them at the end properly, it's the better way to go there because you're constantly adapting to what happens. And there you ship often to get more feedback to, to do that. And that's kind of like a, this shipping more often is more of a means of getting faster feedback of realizing that you went into the wrong direction, that this feature isn't the stuff that they need, that they work differently than you thought and, and, and all that. And that's this, this is how you make the customer more happy because you're, just solving his problem. Mm -hmm. And you get them more involved. And by that, you also get this feeling that they're part of it. So for example, look mm -hmm. at the app, uh, the, uh, at the app economy. Um, when you think about like, when you have an app that is not updated for like half a year, you have the feeling you've been abandoned. And if something is updated and you give feedback and that gets into the app and you look, see it, look, look, that's something that I, that I, that I talked to them about and that I wanted to have, and now it's in there, you actually get more hooked into that because it's part of what you need. And understood, okay. 
And agreed. But does that mean that you, you need to build your teams differently? I mean, um, one, you probably need some kind of framework that you follow. I don't know if you follow a scrum, a scrum master or something, um, but you probably need some product marketing or you need some yes. product manager. You, you need a, a set team that actually can play in these concepts of iterations, right? Yes. So uh, your organizational structure is different to what a waterfall is. Waterfall is you get your stuff from above, you work on it and you finish it. And then someone makes a check mark, says fine. And then it gets released and everybody sees what happens. Um, agility when properly done is far more involvement from the, from the whole flow of where does the ticket come from to how does it get, uh, get delivered um, to the customer? How do you, build feedbacks loop, how do you work with critique? Um, and you as from a development standpoint, you also get closer to the customer because you have to understand how he works. While in a classic waterfall project, there's a big paper and there stands implemented this way, this way, this way, and you don't have to care. So there is more involvement in this, but it's actually stuff that people want. Uh, very interesting because I think you, you, you point out one topic that, um, a lot of leaders see, and I think CTOs as well as any other leader, is this question of um, developers being close with the customer, with the end mm -hmm. user, and thinking not in how do I ship this ticket, but does the way that the ticket is described, the design has been done, make does it actually make sense now that I know how the, um, <laughs> the tech side of, of, of the work looks like? Um, so, yeah, so, how do you stand it, there? It's it, it, it's interesting too. It's, and I often look in companies of like where are the tickets coming from, and you have different drivers in companies. You have sales, you have product, you have when you're a tech company, stuff should come out of tech, and it should not just be infrastructure. It should deliver user value, user value. And the more and closer you get to teams, if they are, for example, cross-functional, um, which is something which is quite preferred in that way of working, the closer you get them to the customer the more they understand and they actually will bring in tickets on how to make stuff better, different, or like introduce ideas for features because they then know what the customer is actually doing. And also mm. that again, fosters ownership because it's something that you brought up and you brought into the, into the flow. And that makes you also proud as a, as a developer developers, we want to solve problems. Mm -hmm. I mean, whose responsible is, responsibility is it? Is it the CTO or the, the CEO that needs to push agile mindset or, or concepts and so, then coach people and mentor them? Or how, how do you do that? So the, I've seen it work best when you have a, like a bigger company, I'd say like of 500 plus, um, is when you move and you want to change to agile working is when you move it from both sides. So you start with some... Um, like seeds where you take, an, take a department and it starts working agile, but it also has to come from enough. If you still say, but I need those 15 reports that are usually transported to middle management to you up and you still say, I want to have this this way from the top and you're not engaging into the same way of, okay, I give that ownership to someone else so that I can focus more on strategic sides and, and I will trust them that they are going to do it properly based on the uh, vision and, and goals that we have, um, then it will just stop there. And there is one place where you don't want to be. And that's the place between the agile seed and the command and control top. I call that, um, <laughs> a zone of despair because, um, the lower part is not reacting. Uh, the inner part, uh, the agile part is not reacting to your demands anymore the way you need it to report up. And if you make a transition in a company to agile, you have to do this from both sides and, 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 and like educate the, the leadership into what agility actually is. And that's not implementing a process. That's the cheap, easy way for making that Gartner check. Um, but it's not what agile, what agility and this agile mindset actually is. And as I said before, it's still better than nothing, but it's not the cake that you originally wanted. Okay. 
Now, we spoke a bit about big organizations, and then it's clear you, you can put a framework on it, and it might even mm -hmm. make sense to follow um, a concept very strictly to make sure that the whole organization follows it. Now, um, we have a mm -hmm. lot of small companies, right? And we have a lot of small yeah. innovative companies. Um, yeah. Is, it, is there A, a size where it makes sense to do it, B, a size where it makes sense to follow a certain methodology, or is it okay to find your own concept in the beginning? So... From my point of view, what I often do, I start with Scrum just to have a starting point. And then what happens is it starts evolving into the agile process of that company. Um, if you think how Scrum works, like, for example, the last meeting is the retro. What is the retro is about? The retro is about what do we want to change? What doesn't work for us? And what do we want to do differently? And the moment you properly do this, you divert from the original framework somehow because you say, okay, for example, um, let's say the dailies don't work for us. And then the first question would be, do you actually know what the dailies are for? So what is the purpose of a daily? And the original purpose of a daily is to foster communication, is to get people together in a room and talk to each other. It's not about to report to the product manager or something or like, explicitly just tell what you did. That's kind of like how it's facilitated often, but it's, it means is foster communication. And I have a nice example for that, how that goes wrong. But um, if you know, I can come back to that later. If you know what the purpose is, you can exchange that to something differently and serving the same purpose. For example, you could say like, we're not doing a daily, we're just five people. We're doing a, doing a lunch together. And somehow there in the conversation, we usually know what everybody's doing. And when you become bigger, we're doing something different because we had a way of how we do that purpose. And that goes to nearly every ceremony, for example, in the Scrum process has a purpose. And if you know what that purpose is and not just like, okay, we have to do it, then you can exchange that with something that works better for you. And that is, in my opinion, in what I experienced, every company works differently. You start with something and then you work yourself in and you understand how the people that you have with you, how the environment, how the customers, um, how they interact with you. And then you can figure out how you want to do that process with them so that it suits you best. Okay. Does that mean that you take different teams into the daily or is the daily a pure tech daily or product team daily? Who's, who's usually for you part of a, of a daily? So the foster communication in the team is part of is the team. Um, if you want to foster communication in the whole company, you have to find a different way. That's not a daily because that's just too big. You cannot stand with 50 people in a row and everybody gets 20 seconds. That's just take ages and doesn't matter. Um, that's, but it's also interesting when you see companies getting bigger because, um, for example, companies below 50 employees usually 80% of your communication is happy. It happens at the coffee machine or at like social interactions or informal uh, communication. When you, mm -hmm. when you switch over 50 in remote companies a bit more early because like there is no coffee machine, <laughs> but um, when you, when you get over 50, the amount of communication ways that are in such a company becomes too big to like spread it by word. And you have to start implement more formal ways of how you communicate. That could be a weekly where every department can talk about stuff that can be uh, groups that are put together out of different departments to talk about things. Um, so there, there are a lot of ways on how you can foster communication there um, and, and build a layer over the agile layer of every, every team to get that company, uh, that uh, communication transferred. Okay. Um, but it's kind of like, it's, 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 yeah. it's really different for every, every company. Okay. That's why I, I usually I, also I mean, don't like this. We implement this because as I said, the last meeting is how do, of Scrum is how do we change this? So it's really rather teaching the mindset, right? It's yes. teaching the mindset, the, the logic, potentially one methodology, yes. let's say Scrum, um, yeah. starting off with that and then looking into it and yes. iterating the, the concept by itself, actually. And I had teams that started with Scrum went to Kanban and then did something that just was right for their flow in their company with their way. And it's also never finished. You grow, you get more people, your process will change. And this is also part of the mindset is 
part of an agile mindset is to accept change, to embrace change. And that means your process is never done. It's just another state at that time before you move on to the next better state, continuous improvement every day based on the environment you have. You grew, different environment. You shrink, different environment. Adapt to it and find the way that works best for you. Okay. Um, how does it work with other management methodologies, OKRs, <laughs> or whatever goals you want to set in the company? Is it, it, it sounds always a bit like holacracy and OKRs are potentially ideal concepts if you live them the right way to, to work with an agile team. Or, um, do they interact? So, sure, they do. Um, OKRs for me is a bit like, it, it always feels for me like agility on a business level. So a bit more like bigger, the, the, the sprint is three, three months long. And if properly done, OKRs usually um, deal with 20 to 30% of your, of your daily work. The rest is business as usual. So OKRs, our original idea, are a mean to foster a bottom-up approach of what could we do with the company to reach our goals, to get the knowledge, to tap into the knowledge of all your employees and their understanding of their departments and what they do and their part of their of 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 the of the whole thing on how to produce their product and to come up with ideas on how to make that better and then you go into alignments and see how the other departments think about so you start spreading that knowledge uh, and by that you foster another way of creativity of thinking ah that's how marketing thinks about it that's how they think the they kind of like play then into what the team does. What I always fear and see often is a bit, it's like when the OKRs are 80% of your work, because then it's a tick, it's a tick, tick to-do list from the top. And often it's has nothing to do with agility and, and bottom up anymore. It's, but like there's um, 50 meetings where, where leadership is dictating of what's in your list and you have to make checkboxes and it becomes a competition of who made the, the, who checked the most boxes or like who did hundred percent. Okay. I was originally in the stretch goals. They are meant to fail. You should only reach 80%, but you should aim for the hundred. And we're really good with that. We're failing every, every single time. Yeah. And that's, and that's, <laughs> and that's fine. And, and that's okay. And, and, and if you look at the guide, the first thing, what they, what they talk about is like the outcome of this should not be in your annual performance review. Because it's a stretch goal. It's a, we try something and that's very agile, trying something out, figuring out if it works and then take the learnings and adapt. Uh, but yeah, like right. a lot that's of that's companies that's do, think. do another layer of task lists on top of the original exactly. task so list. If, if, you, if you use your OKRs like a project list, you have an issue. Yeah. You define them based on the problem that you want to solve or a high yeah. level KPI like an NPS or something like that, then it yeah. can really encourage people to talk to users, to work together, to solve this problem in an agile way. Yeah. And it's very important for leadership to like give proper goals. So like if, if, if your mole is, we want to have 50 million GMV, that's not an inspiring goal. That's just money. So, um, The, this, if you see that, that your leadership is not able to formulate something that is like how we help the user, how we make their life better for him, you know where you're at. Um, then it's all about the money. Um, and that's usually like a bit of the purpose that people that get ownership that they usually have and, and also want to see, especially when you come to Generation Z. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. I think our OKR process for us, we've been, I don't know how long, three years, four years using OKRs. And I have the feeling that we still every quarter uh, improve our OKR up setup. And sometimes we go a bit back and we say, now it's okay again to take this in because X, Y, Z reason yeah. allows us to go a bit off the But framework or something like that. That's exactly why I have this feeling. It's a kind of like agility on a, like a larger scale, like more company wide, because you also go afterwards, make a retro, see what worked, what didn't work. Why didn't you achieve some goals? Was what the environmental flaw? What do we have to do different next time? Do we want to change the process? Does it already work for you or did it feel wrong something and then you adapt and you change it's just because it's it's on business size it has a larger time span to do stuff but it always feels a lot like like scrum scrum on business so what should a tech leader do to 
one, perhaps assess if they're actually working in an agile way, and, and two, mm-hmm. to make sure that the that they lead in an agile way or that they um, establish this kind of agile mindset within their team. So well, when I, as an interim, come somewhere, I usually start to listen at the beginning a lot. And what I try to figure out from the teams and from product management and from marketing is the first thing is where are all the tickets coming from? So uh, do they all come from sales? Do they all come from product? What is the percentage of tickets from tech um, that I that are in the the holes that say whole backlog? And by that, I usually all, already get a kind of a glimpse on who's driving. And as an allegory, what is the English word? I don't know. Um, as an a- 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 allegory, <laughs> um, often companies look like there's like a, like people in a car. There's a driver. There's someone in the passenger, uh, in the passenger, uh, in the second seat, and you have people in the back, people in the back. Engineering often is the people in the back. Someone makes a decision, drives them, and they do something. And if you look at that and try to map where people sit in the car, an agile company still has the CEO and the driving wheel, but the person on the seat next to him changes all the time. Like every time they stop, sometimes it's tech, sometimes it's product, sometimes it's it's marketing. So they have kind of a flow where everybody is involved in how to improve what we're doing, showing the way, giving hints, giving ideas, and not just some people in the back are being driven. And this is where this owner, where I always see what if if you already have some kind of ownership, and then you look at the at the at the meetings what they do and there was once a daily where i knew this has lost its purpose um so i was there um just as a as a listener and they were talking and there was a designer talking about like today is a great day i really love this agile process all my tickets are done i have nothing to do everybody listen go on six people later uh, there was a developer that said yeah i'm currently waiting for these designs uh, so i'm a bit blocked um, but I'm going to figure it out. Meeting ended. Everybody wanted to leave. I said, stop. And I said, well, why? I said, when did you stop listening to each other? This is a communication meeting, but you two have not heard. Your... When he said he needed design, you should have immediately jumped in and said, like, oh, really? I thought I have done everything. Or vice versa. When he said, I have nothing to do and you're missing design, you should have said, look, I still have something to do. But you all just stand there and talk to your PO or Scrum Master, but you were not talking to each other anymore. This is not the purpose of that meeting. This is you're playing it and you'll be here every day. Um, I had another team, whenever the Scrum Master was not there, the daily didn't happen. So I thought like, for whom is that meeting? It's not for him. He's just there mm-hmm. helping you. So, and there you see that these kind of stuff is often just like done because it's part of how we work. But the moment the authorities are missing, they get lost. And then you know that they don't know what it's for. And you can do it, you can do a weekly if that's enough for you. You don't have to do a daily. And that's why I say it's every time it's different. It really depends on the team, the product, the environment, the customer, and all that stuff. But you should know what each ceremony is for so that you know when I'm trading this away, what am I missing? Is that something that I want? Or do I want to do something to get that information for what it originally was? Okay. Now, you speak as a as a senior manager, right? You've mm-hmm. been several times interim CTO and CTO and on all sides. It's not a question. It's, if I don't have this knowledge, how do I get it? Do I read books or I get an agile <laughs> coach or what? If, what is what is my really operation like? How how do I get started? Actually, it's it's, it's not that easy. So. You could buy agile coaches, ask them how they, how they do their stuff. If it's mindset or process, if you get someone process, you get a process implemented. Um, if you have something in mindset, you can learn a lot. Um, you could originally read the agile manifesto. Um, although it is a bit esoteric, um, if you understand what the values are that they try to do, and if you read a bit about the history, what they try to fix, you understand far better how these processes emerged and what they try to do. Um, You could get in some mentors. Um, There's a great platform, the Mentoring Club here in Berlin, 
where you can get uh, where you can get a mentor that helps you on this, where you can find people that know that. But and does he write you a mentor there as well? I'm a mentor there too. Yeah, perfect. But it's, right. but it's pro bono, so I don't get anything from there. Um, okay, uh, but that's a good way to get get to you if anyone is interested yes, in, in having also. a chat. LinkedIn yeah. or probably the mentor. But it's really get yourself educated. And, and as I said, it's not faster, cheaper, and I can change everything. And it's not safe. Understood. Super interesting. So we're, we're approaching the end uh, of the call. So I have, I have one more question that is not about agile methodology. Okay. So I already took away that we need to look back into our product team and the company and make sure that, that we have the right mindset. Because I think to me, what I, I really learned is um, that mindset makes a difference, right? It's it's not the, totally. it's not following the process. It's really the no. mindset of everyone. Now, as a CTO in general, do you have any podcast books, blogs, or any kind of resource where you would say this is something I recommend? This is something that helped me a lot in my development. There, there is someone that I really like on LinkedIn. That's Boris Steiner. He writes very good stuff, and he has also like this mindset approach. Um, there are tons of good books when you want to come to product discovery, like everything from Marty Keegan, um, which is really great. Um, I've recently read, um, Radical Candor, which is already always a good book. Um, yeah. there, there are millions of, uh, there, there are really good books. Um, also <laughs> again, mentoring club has a, has a, has a, <laughs> has a page that like books will recommend that is actually quite good. Cool. That is very helpful. I think that's really great because um, I agree. I, I always get some book recommendations from friends and um, yeah. yeah, there are a few good ones that just help so much. Uh, but one, one thing, book. if you want to properly into one thing that I forgot at the beginning is it's really by heart. Um, you should not try to learn it just by reading. You have, I, my, my strong belief is that the best way of learning something is to experience how it works. That's why when I move a team into agility, I usually make small experiments with them and ask them afterwards if that feels better or worse. And by them, get I get them introduced to the ideas behind it and, and things. But like just giving another speech on how we work today would not change them. It's always people have to experience how how that works and how it changes how they work and if you do that bit by bit you get them far 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 more down the road than you would get them by like this is on your process here's the chart welcome powerpoint um you have to get them experience that and that same goes to leadership the more you experience the more you can say for yourself how that felt and how it changed how you perceived the work customer, the way your team feels and, and, and how it felt for you. Fantastic. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. I think, um, and probably on top, if you have a sparring partner or a mentor to discuss yeah. this with, it's, it's, it's awesome. so helpful. It's also a fraction you experience and you accelerate yeah. with that. It's also where, where in startups, fractional CTOs could help, um, you know, people that come in for like four, eight hours uh, a week. And help you like to 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 ship the the sea of we are growing. What does it mean for my culture? Um, how do I have to change processes? What is your experience and what that will do with my team um, growing? So from the family of five to we become 50, 80, 120 and helping startups there. Um, something that I also do um, uh, in kind of like really short breaks, becoming a mentor, a coach, on these issues, helping startup to ship those, those, they are wandering seas where you could easily make a big mistake and then lose like 10% of your, of your workforce, just because you just thought this would be nice. And in the end, it's just a big flaw in your environment. Thank you so much, Florian. Thanks that has been me. really uh, a fantastic session. I would have uh, not expected to get such great value out of the first podcast session that we do. And um, I'm you. very excited that we started doing this. Um, thanks a lot for, for being a guest. Um, for all the listeners, um, this has been the first episode. There are 
Many to Follow. It's today's Top Tech Leaders podcast. Um, so make sure that you subscribe to our channel. Give us feedback if you have any questions or if you want something else or if you have the feeling that there are some speakers or interesting topics that we should cover. Um, please let us know. And for that, until next time, thanks a lot. Keep coding, keep leading. Thank you very much. Thank you.